Today's guest is Mike Rink from Komala Tech, who is joining us today from Vancouver. So good morning to Vancouver in Canada. And he's going to tell us something about how to collaborate uh, in conference without losing control. So with that, without further ado, over to you, uh, Mike, and your presentation. And you're already sharing your screen. So I have been talking about your presentation for five minutes now behind your first slide. That's good to know. <laughs> so you have been introduced. And I'm going offline now. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to be here, everybody. As uh, you just heard, my name's Mike Rink. I'm the marketing manager here at Kamala Tech. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, thanks as well uh, to Jorg and Hubert for uh, kindly inviting me and organizing this event. Uh, it's so nice. I I've done a couple of these remote uh, Atlassian events now. And uh, it's really such a nice opportunity for me to be talking to people because, quite frankly, our own local um, community here in Vancouver has kind of gone dark. So it's nice to see that there are uh, quite a few groups that are still being active, meeting remotely, and it's actually so nice to hear that you guys are going to have uh, a socially distance in-person one soon. That's so great for, for you uh, and your group. So hopefully Vancouver can, can follow suit before too long. Uh, but yes, my... Uh, my purpose here today is to chat a little bit about uh, Confluence. And it's really interesting coming to these events because quite often, uh, at least in my you know, personal experience, they're dominated by people with JIRA questions. And uh, you know, rightly so, JIRA is a really important product for so many of us and what we do. Uh, but Confluence, uh, for those of you that are maybe less familiar with it, is growing in leaps and bounds as far as how many teams are using it. And Atlassian has a really defined uh, marketing strategy where they want to get your team started with Jira because, like I said, it's such a great tool. But they also want you to start uh, expanding your use of Atlassian tools. And one of the first ones that people will often land into after Jira is Confluence. And uh, let me just give you a quick background into Kamala Tech before we kind of jump into the, the meat of the presentation. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kamala Tech, uh, we're one of Atlassian's platinum top marketplace partners. And we've actually been in the ecosystem for over 10 years now. Um, way back then, you know, when Confluence was kind of a fledgling product, our CEO Roberto saw its potential as a collaborative tool. And it encouraged him to build add-on products for it. Uh, and today, our apps are used by thousands of Confluence teams around the world. Um, you might recognize teams like Samsung, Visa, Volkswagen, Apple. Uh, we have customers worldwide, both here in North America uh, and in the EU as well. And it's been fascinating to watch Confluence change I don't know how many people have been on the same journey with us, but it's grown from this thing that was just a wiki builder into, you know, an entire documentation suite. Um, it's our opinion that no other piece of software can help teams write content like it can. Uh, and I think that that opinion must be popular because there's now over 40,000 Atlassian customers using it. Confluence, it, it brings teams together to create and share documents so quickly. Uh, it, it's really sometimes frightening to see how quickly a Confluence instance can grow, uh, you know, from just that, those small beginnings into a huge labyrinth. Um, and this is, unfortunately, one of the challenges with using, pardon me, using Confluence. Um, when your team is empowered just to freely create documentation quickly and easily, uh, it can have an unintended consequence. And that is all of a sudden your Confluence instance grows into kind of a mess. You know, life can be simple when you start out. You just got a couple spaces and there's maybe a few pages. Uh, but before long, that, um, you know, simple setup that you have just spirals out of control. So the, I, I think that the, the, the first thing I'd like to talk about is how do you stay organized inside of Confluence? Um, 
so what, I, what I'm gonna share here really quick is just a few best practices uh, that we found use, uh, from our own experience with the product, as well as the experience of our customers, things that they've done to help them maintain a clean and easy to use instance. Apologies to some of this is review for some of you, but again, I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, the biggest thing is to keep organized and good organization, pardon me, good organization starts with the logical use of spaces. So spaces are what you'll use to divide your content into more manageable pieces. Uh, as you can see in the diagram on the right hand side of the presentation here, uh, at the very top, you've got your Confluence dashboard. And what you don't want to do is have a thousand pages underneath that global dashboard. What you want is your instance segmented into a number of spaces. In this example diagram, you see we've got our dev team in one space, our HR documents are another space, our marketing documents are another space. Keep your content segmented and it, you know, it may not be based on your team's functionality. It may be based on projects or it may be based on something that's more defined because perhaps you're using it for a quality management system and you have to follow a certain format. Either way, make sure you're utilizing spaces to actually divide your content. And the nice thing about that is that not only does it keep those spaces organized with the right content inside of it, but it gives you more control over who is seeing what content. If you have important planning documents, let's say, that are for managers only, uh, you can control access to that specific space to make sure that uh, people who shouldn't have access to it can't see it. Sometimes you'll have content that is related to other pages and other spaces. And unfortunately, what some teams end up doing is simply duplicating the content. Um, you know, when we were, we were just talking about the HR documents, maybe there's a, a new policy that comes out that just speaks to a certain group. Instead of taking that content and duplicating it into a different space, uh, what we recommend is using labels. Confluence labels uh, are useful for linking content together that is in separate areas inside of your Confluence instance, uh, quite often in different spaces. And the nice thing about labels is they really don't fundamentally change the structure of your instance at all. It's still you know, set up into different spaces, uh, but all of a sudden you have labels that can link individual pages or groups of content in different spaces, and those labels are searchable. So your team can pull labeled content together to see things that are related uh, really quickly and easily. But it's not just about um, sort of setting up the organization and the, uh, the, the fundamental superstructure of your Confluence instance. It's also making sure that when your team is building your content, that that content is high quality and has a lot of consistency. Uh, it's no good if everybody that writes an HR policy writes it in a different way, or everybody who writes software requirements writes that page in a different way. You want to have consistency in all your pages. And the best way to enforce that consistent quality is to use templates. Um, you might know them in Confluence's blueprints. Uh, these blueprints will precisely lay out the information that's needed on a page so team members know exactly what's needed uh, and you're encouraged not to add unnecessary details provided you follow that format. Uh, we use a lot of templates internally at Qualitech um, for our software requirements, uh, for our meeting notes, uh, I know that other clients of ours, they've shown us templates that they use. Uh, it's really a good practice for teams to be spending the time to create those templates. Uh, but sometimes your needs may go beyond uh, what is native to Confluence as far as keeping control over your Confluence content. Um, you know, those three tips that I just gave you are certainly best practices and I encourage everybody to use them, but for some teams, your needs may be greater than that. Uh, you might need help not just organizing your content, but actually ensuring that that content meets company standards. Um, how do you allow teammates to collaborate without losing control of that documentation? Well, the answer, we think, is our app Kamala Document Management. Kamala Document Management brings order to Confluence by enforcing review and approval workflows on your content. 
uh, these workflows ensure that pages are reviewed and approved before they're published and helps put the right content in front of the right users. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is just discuss three critical pieces of documentation functionality uh, along with three real-world examples of teams using that functionality. Uh, so the first one is how teams can add reviews and approvals to their Confluence documents. Uh, the second is how you can use document management to control page visibility. And the third is how you can use document management to meet compliance standards. Uh, so when I talk about add reviews and approvals, um, you know, there's some of you that may be doing that now in Confluence without any type of app or add-on. We've seen teams that will approve content by adding a comment to the page, or maybe you have some metadata on the page that somebody, you know, adds their signature to as saying it's approved. And these kind of approvals are totally fine. But when I talk about reviews and approvals, I'm talking more about an actual formal review and approval process, one that is repeatable across all of your content, one that is auditable, that has a history and is permanent inside those pages. Um, you can actually see a big difference in teams that spend the time to follow a review and approval process because your content is not only just marked as approved, but it actually ends up better. Um, anytime you have a review and approval process that is stopping the page from being published until it's approved, that content has to go through a review cycle. It's going to uh, you know, have multiple versions before finally somebody says, great, it's done, we can move this forward. That leads to better content. And that does run somewhat against what Confluence talks about or what Atlassian talks about. Confluence is open, Confluence is the future of work, it's wonderful. And Yes to all those things. It certainly is wonderful and it does allow you to work together. But for a lot of teams, you can't just have the Wild West. You have to have your content more locked down so that it meets standards before it's published. Um, we have in Kamala document management, these customized review processes that we call workflows. Uh, these workflows uh, can be applied to any page in your instance. They can be applied uh, to individual pages or they can be applied across entire spaces. The nice thing about them is that nothing changes about how your team works with Confluence. Uh, you're still making comments, you're still writing in the page, you're still um, working either real time or asynchronously to work on those documents. The, you still have that freedom to write the content. The difference is that we are making sure that it is published or pardon me, that it is approved before it is published and other people see it. So let's take a look at a real world example of how these approval processes can actually help your documentation. Um, because this is the exact experience of our customer Cerner. Uh, Cerner's Confluence deployment is massive. It's got over 100,000 controlled documents, uh, over 2,000 spaces, and it's accessed daily by 128,000 users and clients. Documents include things like employee instructions, reference pages, help articles, company policies, uh, among all other kinds of content. Uh, the process for creating and maintaining these documents has to comply with a number of regulatory agencies. So to manage all this documentation, they use a collection of our approval workflows uh, for content approval, which is based around a four-step approval process and then a two-step obsoleting process. So in order for a document to be considered finalized, it has to meet four steps and then that content will also be reviewed through the approval process at a later date uh, to see if it's obsolete and needs to be updated or archived. Uh, Kamala Document Management uh, ensures that your team not only has this approval process, but it also lets team members know which documents approved and which aren't, so that the wrong pages aren't being shared. Uh, but this is one component, certainly, to helping your team manage your documents and content and ensuring that you have control. Uh, but there's another element to it as well. Um, your team uh, needs might go beyond just approving or uh, obsoleting content. Uh, sometimes the challenges uh, 
ensuring that team members actually read the approved documents. You might have a great JIRA service desk knowledge base, but does it do you any good if nobody actually reads it? Um, Kamala document management can help with that too. Um, one way that uh, it does that is by automatically controlling the restrictions on an individual page. So you can actually, as your document moves through the approval process, control who sees it. So at the beginning, quite typically, when you're just drafting your page, you have that content locked down. Only the page creator and the people who are approving can see it. And until it meets that final state, you're going to make sure that the rest of your team can't find that page. As soon as that page is approved in Kamala Document Management, it can automatically remove those page restrictions and all of a sudden the team members that need to see it can see it. Uh, but you can actually go further than that even. So maybe you don't just want to lock down individual pages in your Confluence instance. Maybe you want to actually completely separate your draft content from your published content. Um, we actually do this internally in our own product documentation. We want to have documents that we work on uh, in our draft, but we also want our users to be able to view the help documentation whenever they need it. And we don't want them seeing unapproved draft content. So we utilize uh, another of our apps called Kamala Publishing. Uh, Kamala Publishing lets you move approved content from one space to another. Uh, there's an additional app called Kamala Remote Publishing that allows you to move content from one instance to another. So you can have all your draft content that you're working on either in one space or in one instance. Uh, the team collaborates getting that content exactly how they want it. Once you're ready, you can approve the content and have it get automatically pushed out to your published space or your published instance where other people can see it. This ensures that only the right people have uh, access to the draft documentation, um, but it still gives access to the right people who need to see the actual published final documentation. I actually had a, a really great chat with the video game developer Blizzard um, who had this exact same issue. Um, they needed to take their uh, content and share it with subcontracted game studios. So they hired different smaller studios to work on their games. But they can't just give those outside smaller studios direct access to their Confluence instance. So their solution was to use uh, Kamala Document Management and Kamala Remote Publishing. Uh, they created their requirements documents inside a central lockdown secured Confluence instance and worked internally on getting their requirements refined and approved. Once those requirements were approved with Kamala Document Management, they were then published to an external Confluence instance with Kamala Remote Publishing. And in that remote instance, the subcontractors could access, pardon me, access that content on the external servers. So this gets your approved content completely separated from draft content that uh, makes sure that only approved people can see the draft content and the right people are seeing the published approved content. That keeps management happy, it kept IT and security happy, and it keeps the external uh, partners, the external game studios happy because Blizzard gets them the content they need on a timely basis and it's very easy to access this external Confluence instance. Uh, data integrity is important for video game companies where their IP is so important to their success, but in some industries, the approval and distribution of content isn't just a good practice, but it's actually mandated uh, by government or by other agencies, uh, whether it's by laws or certification or by volunteering to adhere to standards. Uh, sometimes teams have documentation needs that go beyond what Confluence as a wiki can do. And that's where Kamala Document Management really has a home. Um, this is where we're talking about using Confluence as uh, not just a documentation hub, but actually as a quality management system. Um, you might be trying to achieve standards like ISO 13485, which is for medical devices. Uh, you might be trying to meet FDA CFR 21. Um, 
And there are very specific requirements inside each of those, uh, including things like e-signatures. Uh, you need to be able to show that not only were your documents signed off by somebody, but the person who signed off actually did it with an electronically signed document. Uh, well, you know, again, Confluence is certainly powerful, but it doesn't necessarily have all the functionality to meet those standards. And that's where an app like Kamala Document Management can really take Confluence uh, to another level to help teams produce content that's inside a QMS that's audit ready. Uh, we have another uh, cu customer who had this real world example um, that they really needed this functionality. Uh, the Indiana Department of Child Services utilizes Confluence for policy making and for producing important documents. And as a critical government service, their record keeping needs to satisfy laws around permanence and documented approvals. And this includes digitally signing documents. And Confluence does a great job with the record handling part of it, uh, but the electronic signatures aren't possible natively. So Kamala Document Management meets the standard by asking approvers to provide two unique pieces of identification when they approve a page. Most commonly, this would be your Confluence username and password. So imagine that you have an important policy document uh, in the department. Uh, this is going to affect children across your whole state. Uh, before it can be considered uh, finalized, it has to be approved. Uh, a manager logs into Confluence, goes to the page, opens up our approval element, puts in their username and Confluence username and password, presses approved. That approval uh, is actioned. The page is published, but also that approval is logged so that if there was a freedom information request later, you'd be able to show uh, who actually signed off on that particular policy. Uh, this arrangement has already helped software teams create compliant documentation systems, uh, and it's actually available in the cloud as well. Uh, Kamala Document, uh, pardon me, Kamala Document Management uh, is built for teams in server and data center environments, but we do have another app called Kamala Document Control uh, that's available in the cloud, uh, and it does have the same electronic signature functionality. So whether you're looking for something in uh, self-hosted or in data center or in the cloud, we have something that will allow you to utilize this functionality in your own documentation. Uh, so my goal here today really simply was to show you how to keep what you love about Confluence, uh, that open work environment, that quick collaboration, the ability to work together with your teammates, uh, even though you might be separated by continents on documentation. Keep all of that, but make sure your documentation doesn't turn into chaos. Um, if you're interested in learning more about how we do that, about compliance and confluence, about managing a knowledge base or taking control of your documentations, um, we also have a webinar uh, on our website. You can visit uh, kamalatech.com uh, or our YouTube channel where we post a webinar that kind of goes into more in depth what you can do uh, with Kamala Document Management. And uh, I'd also encourage you, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to spend some time answering them now, uh, or you can reach out to me at mike at kamalatech.com and I'm always available as, uh, there as well. Um, so I'm, I'll pass it back to York, but uh, thanks so much for sharing this time with me. Very enjoyable on my part. Perfect, thank you, Mike. Um, and we have three questions. The first one. Um, is there a review functionality when a page is published? For example, a page should be reviewed and updated every couple of months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question because it does come up all the time. Um, and how we handle that is when your page is approved, uh, you can actually have that um, approval sit with an expiry. So maybe you need to review your content every six months, or maybe you need to approve your content in a year. Whatever it is, uh, attached to that approval will be an expiry. And at the end of the expiry, you can 
go to the beginning of the review process or you can kickstart a new review. There's different things you can do at that point, but essentially that's how we handle that. So the, the approval expires, it needs to be re-reviewed. It could be as simple as just pressing approve again and then you're back at it, but typically it would go through a review and improvement process. Okay, second question. Is there a user specific task review list from document management where you can check if something is to do or upcoming in regard of reviews. So something like a work list for reviews, if I understand it correctly. Yeah, um, there is for sure. Um, you can, if you're speaking specifically to individual users, uh, they can have an element put onto their Confluence dashboard that lets them know what pages are outstanding for them to review. Uh, so it, when you log into Confluence and you see your main dashboard, you'll always be reminded of those outstanding review tasks that you need to, to execute. Uh, Kamala Document Management will also send people uh, a Confluence alert, uh, the little notification bell in the corner. Uh, it'll send you a notification when you're assigned a review. And you can also set it up if you want to send emails to people. So they'll also get notified that way. So there's a few different ways you can notify people, but they can also keep track uh, with their own dashboard. Okay. Um, my follow-up question for that, is there kind of a, um, do you get a separate dashboard for, let's say somebody who's in compliance, who, who sees how far everything is in the in the improvement process. So what's the current status of all approval processes in the Confluence instance, for example? Yeah, there is, there's quite a bit of reporting options that are available uh, that allow you to see where your content is in the review process. That's a really common use case. Uh, you know, let's say you have a space and you wanna know where the pages are in that space in the review process, you can use document management's reporting to take a look into that space and see what phase each document is at in its review process. Um, the reporting has more flexibility than that as well to do other things, but that's a really common use case. You know, I wanna be able to see where this space's pages are and it's all available in the, the space reporting. And the last question from the Q&A box. Is there a possibility for escalation procedures when a page is not reviewed in a certain amount of time uh, when the review is planned with a workflow? So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and we actually handle that with an expiry as well. So an expiry doesn't just have to sit when a page is approved. Um, without getting into too much detail, basically our app breaks the approval process into different phases and we call those phases states. So your approval might have, it might be really simple. You might just have three states. You might be draft, management approval, approved. It might just be three states. Uh, but you don't want your document just sitting forever uh, in management approval because it might just sit and never get approved and never get published. So you can set an expiry on that approval. And depending on what your needs are, the expiry can resend the notification, the expiry can push the document back um, to the initial draft state so the team can restart the process. Uh, it can even just skip that process altogether. If maybe your documentation approval process uh, doesn't need to be locked down as much as some teams, maybe you're not in a compliance environment or you're not in government, um, you can skip steps if you need to. If you've given your manager two weeks and they haven't approved, then that uh, can expire and move to the approved state. So uh, that's how we would typically handle that situation is with an expiry. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Everybody is now a panelist, so you can unmute and switch on your video if you like. Uh, questions from the audience? I have a question. I have another one. Is that oh. So, okay, friend, go go ahead. I will ask later. So, sorry, uh, is there a, a forwarding uh, for the review task? For for example, like uh, it's get escalated to the manager, and he like decides who should review and forwards it to a specific user, so that yet that user who is not like defined in the workflow gets the review task. 
Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting use case. Um, we, we don't have it set up to work like that necessarily where you would handle it via email. Um, but we do have it set up so that in your workflow, you can determine at the start who's going to handle things at certain phases. So let's say that, you know, you have one master review process that works for your documentation, but, you know, some days it might be this person who reviews it on some pages, it might be this person. Uh, when you start the review process on a page, it can ask, okay, at this given state, who is going to approve the page? And you can enter in a Confluence username, you can enter in a Confluence group if it's a group of people. Um, and so you don't have to necessarily lock yourself into the same people every time. Uh, you can determine who's going to approve a page uh, when you add that approval uh, uh, to when you when you start that approval process. And there is options as well uh, to add that as a page is moving through the review process. So let's say that um, you have a four step review process and at the third step you want to just let somebody choose who makes the most sense to approve the page. You know, it, maybe you have three or four different managers who might be the appropriate one. Uh, we can have a button in the UI that just says uh, add approvers. You can press that button and select anybody in the organization or you can have a list of people who are supposed to, you know, be on that pre-approved list. So there's different ways you can handle that. You don't have to decide on every approver across every page, across every space. You, it does allow you to change that on each individual page if you wanted. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hubert, your question. Okay, my question is, first of all, I see that uh, Komala document management is not available for cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, and correct. the question is, are you working on implementing that or you will focus only on Komala document control in the cloud or, because I see that there is no, huge difference between Komala document control, at least I, I opened the table. And from what I see from the feature perspective, there is only the difference between unlimited workflows, at least in that table. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it has a complicated answer that I don't want to bore everybody with, but I'll, I'll give you the short version. Happy to have a fuller conversation later with anybody who's interested, but just to, to keep things moving. Basically, um, there are limited APIs that are made available in the cloud compared to what we have access in server and data center. Without frightening anybody, there's all kinds of things that we can get in, in data center and server that we can't get access to in the cloud. So on the surface level of approvals, you won't find a major difference between Kamala document management and Kamala document control. Where we have more of a difference is some of the expanded functionality that you get in document management. So when you're managing, you know, on the Cerner level, uh, or actually we have a new use case from the Port of Antwerp, that's a good example. They've got, you know, thousands of people that are accessing documentation. They've got thousands of pages. Um, you can't have, your, your approval process gets to a level of complexity that cloud just doesn't allow. And the, you're, you're, you're very right that when you compare what you can do, yeah, you can still build custom workflows in document control. You can, and actually it's unlimited now. We have, we just are literally updating that, <laughs> that chart today. Um, you can have unlimited custom workflows in Kamala document control, but where you have more limitations is the different triggers that you can use. So we talked about, uh, I didn't get into super details, but uh, we have triggers you can use. Expiry dates are one of those triggers. Uh, action, or sorry, event, then action, right? Um, in server, it's really easy. It can listen for all kinds of events. It can take all kinds of actions. So, you know, we have some customers who have built workflows that ha are just triggers, 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 triggers that are listing for all kinds of things and doing all kinds of things. Document, uh, pardon me, in the cloud, we just don't have the ability to do that. And that's what's holding us back from, you know, calling our, uh, bringing document management to the cloud. So, you, the, the other half of that question of yours was, are we, are we stopping? Like, are, okay, do we have document control in the cloud? Are we done with that? No. Uh, our goal is to push forward until we have something that we're comfortable calling document management in the cloud. 
unfortunately, it's just not there yet. And again, this is not necessarily a Kamala tech issue. If it was up to us, we would it would already be in the cloud. If we could just snap our fingers and have things done, we'd be there because we know that there's demand and we know that this is the direction that Atlassian wants to go. Uh, but until certain um, APIs and webhooks are made available by uh, the product itself in the cloud, there will be limitations and we will continue pushing on our end uh, to do as much as we can. Okay, perfect. And one more use case that I faced once. So, and I'm wondering if it's possible because the approvals are pretty clear for me. But for example, I had that situation that any of the team leads should approve like page. And for example, we have a five team leads and I would like, like let's say one or two of them to approve and the, and the rest doesn't matter. So there is a workaround for that use case or? For sure. So when you're building your workflow, you can decide what the minimum number of approvals will be. Um, but you can assign as many people as you want. So there's, depending on how, what your precise circumstances were with, there's two ways that I would do that. You could assign a whole group to approve a page. So maybe you have a confluence group set up just for those people, um, but you set the minimum approvers to be two or three or whatever makes sense. So you have, you hit that state, that group of four or five people are assigned, two people look through and they say, yeah, it looks good. They press approve. The page will automatically move to the next state. So there's different ways you could do it as far as how you assign. And it gets quite complicated depending on what your needs are, but you can always set a minimum number of approvers to move it forward. Uh, and you can even set it up so that let's say you've got uh, five people assigned but one person's word carries more weight than other people. Maybe you've got, you know, five managers and the CEO. And if the CEO presses approved, it just moves everything forward. So you can do that as well. Oh, good to hear that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks you. for answering. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I have any questions? Um, yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned uh, triggers. So you, uh, so far I understood it was only like, Confluence internal triggers. Uh, do you have like a possibility to get like triggers for uh, tasks um, regarding to the workflow from external sources? For example, like there was a release in Jira for a certain project and you want the documentation to be updated or checked or reviewed. Mm, that's really interesting. Um... As we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a trigger that would allow you to do that. Our, our triggers are event listeners, but they're listening for confluence events. So theoretically, if, if you went in and edited something on the page, for example, that could be a trigger that would then kick off a review process. Um, because we can set up your workflow to listen for edits to the page and then take an action of reverting to a different state. Uh, but I wonder if you could use um, scripting to do that as well, because we are integrated with a couple of scripting tools uh, with script runner and with power scripts for confluence. Uh, conceivably you could have it set up so that when um, to, to, to run a script that's listening for this thing happening in Jira that then starts a review process. Uh, I'd have to, I couldn't commit to that necessarily, but that sounds very similar to something that we worked on with um, uh, Script Runner, pardon me, where um, basically there's a script that when a, uh, it works in the reverse, when a Confluence page reaches its final approve state, it kickstarts uh, a JIRA project. Um, but it might be possible to do that in reverse. Um, I would have to look into that to that more. But uh, yeah, I don't know that we would have uh, a way to listen for that internal trigger uh, in Confluence. Uh, but it certainly is an interesting use case to see how those could be linked together. And, and we get questions like that all the time um, because you know Jira is such a big tool for people um, in this ecosystem. You know, how do you how do you link those processes together? Um, that's something that's, that's challenged us for a long time and we're, we've made progress on over the years, but we're certainly not at the point yet where things are speaking kind of one-to-one. -one. Okay. 
Any oh. other questions from the audience? Then I have a question regarding remote publishing. Mm -hmm. um, I understood that correctly. Remote publishing means I have my own confluence instance and my approval process and my holy of holies. And if something is for the world, I can just push it to another confluence instance. Is that correct? That's right. Um, so that could be any confluence instance. Is it that... could be. In, fa in fact, it could be a different hosting environment if you wanted. Okay. Could so have basically... a... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, York. Yeah, so it basically could be in another domain, completely behind it, another, whatever, in a different network, whatever. As long yep. as I can reach it, I can push it there. As long what as you can reach it and create a user in that remote instance. Okay, would that include uh, cloud instances? Yep. Yeah, in fact, one of our clients, Tyler Technologies, is just deploying a knowledge base solution uh, with this same setup. They've got their internal team working on knowledge documents. Uh, I think they're in server. They might be in data center. Either way, they're, they're working on their own server documents. Once that's approved, it gets pushed to a cloud Confluence server so that the knowledge base is out there for people to actually find the knowledge right. documents. So that could also be a transition scenario until you are done with the full integration of document, document management into the cloud, basically. Look, it sounds like it. So you, you, could, you could use it that way. It does mm -hmm. get a little bit complicated when, because it's not a two way street. Oh, okay. You can't push your edits in the cloud back to the mm -hmm. server. So there, there might be a good way to initially get your content there and then you start building mm -hmm. it. But the, the difficult part is how do you make sure people aren't logging into the cloud and changing things and then oops, I sent the revised stuff from my server and now I've overwritten all the changes that were in the cloud because somebody was confused about which space to work in. Yeah. So, you know, we, we post warnings and things like that to stop that from happening, but it, it can still happen. So it, it's very important people understand it's not, it's not a sync per se. You're not syncing mm -hmm. one to the other. You're just pushing published content. So whatever's in your draft space is gonna get sent to the published space. But still for use cases like, let's say, knowledge base, product documentation, which are read only once they are published, basically. And you only have, let's say, the Jira service desk or something next to it where you can raise a question or have a Q&A page or whatever. Um, that would be a, a feasible use case for transition. Precisely. Yep. Yeah. We have a lot of customers who use it uh, very yeah. similarly to that. Okay, so I keep a small server and I have a big cloud instance for everybody who's just reading, reading that content. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's in my, that answers my question. Any other questions from the audience? Nope. Going once, going twice, and going three times. Hubert, do you have something? To, another one? No? No, just waving. Thanks for a nice presentation. Just waving. And okay. for nice <laughs> <laughs> waving. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. So, um, thanks to everyone for participating. Thanks to Mike. Have a nice day in Vancouver. Have a nice evening everywhere else. Or well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Very, very kind of you to uh, mm. to allow me to come into your group and talk to you for a little while. And I, as I said, it was it's so great for me to have this opportunity because I'm not getting it locally. <laughs> Anytime. If you if you are done with your cloud integration, drop us an email. We would have, would be happy to have you back to talk about that. Great. That would be really great because there are um, a lot of people thinking about moving in the cloud. And um, we heard last week that it's the add-ons that are the thing that you have to think about, mm. not so much the base instances. So um, so if you have that done, let us know. Will uh, do. And just a reminder to everybody else, we have next week um, Matt Reiner from K15T. And we have another conference highlight this month in three weeks. Uh, the conference product team conference will be here and tell us about all the new cool things that will happen in the cloud. So again, cloud. Um, so lots of conference stuff this month. Um, with that, again, thank you, Mike. Have a nice day. See you around. Stay healthy and everybody else the best of times. See you. Bye.